All right, it looks like we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the this episode of Science in uh, cooperation with Scientific American. And we are so excited to have two uh, well-known science communicators with us today, Jennifer Wallet and Sean Carroll. And um, I assumed it was common knowledge that um, people knew these two were a married couple. But it's, that's not the case. I found that out on social media today. So indeed, they are married. So uh, I would in addition to their individual works, I'm really excited to find out how does that dynamic work, uh, being two writers and two <laughs> science-focused people in the same household. So, um, so welcome. And my co-host here is Jeff Schomeyer, and uh, you'll get to talk to him in just a little bit. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Wallet, who is um, a blogger at Scientific American, just like I am, and her blog is uh, Cocktail Party Physics, which I've been following for years, ever since I sort of discovered the internet, because um, she always uh, has really interesting uh, takes on the natural world and physics uh, with a lot of uh, pop culture mixed in. And uh, you see that running throughout all of her work, which includes four uh, very well-received books. Um, and let me get the list. So The Physics of the Buffyverse, uh, which I actually really enjoy. The Calculus Diaries, How Math Can Help You Lose Weight, Win in Vegas, and Survive a Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, me, Myself, and Why is her latest book, which is Searching for the Science of Self. Um, which I finished a few days ago and found very engaging. And I have to say, and I, I will get to this as a topic to talk about, uh, that nobody writes books like Jennifer. Jennifer chooses very unique topics to write about. And that's what I, uh, I find really appealing about her work. So Jennifer, welcome. Thank you for oh, joining thanks. us. <laughs> Thank you. And I get to introduce Sean Carroll, who is a working astrophysicist. His PhD from Harvard was in astronomy and astrophysics, I read, and he's now at Caltech. <laughs> and um, I made a note, he has cemented his reputation as a gifted science communicator by appearing on the Colbert Report. And I even have a friend who's listened to one of his series of recorded lectures, so I know he's <laughs> penetrating the popular mind. His recent book is The Particle at the End of the Universe, right back here all about the Higgs boson. Previously, he published From Eternity to Here about what time is and where it came from. He started blogging in 2004 at Preposterous Universe. Then in the summer of 2005, he joined forces with fellow science bloggers at Cosmic Variance, which has reputedly become the world's most popular blog written by physicists. And I just read this morning that he announced his engagement to Jennifer on that blog. And according to what she wrote in her book, which I just finished this morning, Sean is one of the heroes of her life. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much. I did, people do need to know that there is no such thing as cosmic variance anymore, so it can't really count as the world's most popular physics blog anymore. So I'm which, all by myself these days. OK, it was once the world's most popular blog. It was a free by That's right, yes. <laughs> But things, things move along at the speed of the internet. So I've, I've read both of these books, and you have given us two very, very different but very enjoyable books. One is about the Higgs boson, how we understand the universe, and one is about the human and how we understand ourselves. And so naturally, I was trying to find the common theme. I don't know how well I did, but a favorite adage came to mind, that new things get discovered by science when science comes up with new tools that give us different ways to look at nature and the world and, and ourselves. So I wanted to start with an essay question. Tell us about, Tell us about some, some of the some tools and new ways, ways of, looking of looking that led to the topics that showed up in your book. And maybe you'd like to start, Sean. I'll start because it looks like Jennifer is frozen, and now we see a picture of her having a drink on my screen. I don't know. Uh, that's that's not, what I see. That's, that's what I see, too. So I'm sure she'll, she'll come back. She'll reanimate very shortly. That's right. So, uh, But it's a, it's a great question because you know it's a truism that scientific progress is driven by technology, but it's even more true than many people think, in particular in particle physics. When we look for new particles like the Higgs boson or so forth, 
there's just no way it would have been conceivable without this new technology, the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is the most complicated, most large and impressive what? machine ever built by human beings. And the reason why it needs to be so big and complicated is because we're trying to smash particles together at energies that have never been achieved by human beings. The universe does it all the time. Cosmic rays are hitting the atmosphere of the Earth with much higher energy than we can make at the Large Hadron Collider. But, you know, we needed to build not only something big, 15 miles around, uh, 100 yards underground outside Geneva, but also something very, very cold. They're, it's filled with magnets that are superconducting so that they can keep the temperature and the magnetic fields at the right level without overheating. Uh, an enormous amount of data transmission technology. As many people know, the World Wide Web was a minor spin-off of the attempts at CERN to do particle physics in the high data-driven mm. era. So, and without being able to do that, without having these amazing technologies to push things to higher and higher energies, more and more data, we would not have found the Higgs boson. And it happens over and over again, and, and in physics and astronomy especially, it's just clear that the better your technology is, the more you learn about the world. Which go ahead and take just, just a moment to make that connection between uh, why we need higher energies, what it is about energy, and what we can see as we get uh, colliders that can collide things with ever greater energies. Right. Well, you know, tomorrow will be the 135th birthday of this guy named Albert Einstein, and he came up with a little expression called E equals MC squared, which you should interpret as if you have an object at rest, not doing anything, just sitting there, like a baseball or an elementary particle not moving, it has an energy. It has its rest energy, which is basically its mass times the speed of light squared. So mass is one form that energy can take. And when we look at elementary particles, we're trying to create particles at higher and higher masses because it, massive particles tend to decay into lighter ones. Heavy particles tend to not last around. They just tend to go away. In the early universe, we think there were who knows how many different particles, but they've all transformed into other ones. So today, around us, you and I are made out of some of the lightest particles in nature, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons, right? So we want to make heavier particles because they've all gone away. We don't see them in our everyday lives. And the way that we make heavier particles is to make more energetic collisions because E equals MC squared. The way to make a massive particle is to put a lot of energy into a very small region of space. And the, the irony is that to do that, you need a gigantic machine. So to make the smallest possible pieces of nature, you need the largest possible experiment. OK, so Jennifer essay question for you. When I was reading, it struck me that a lot of the things you were able to write about um, in your book are things that you could not have written about even 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There's a lot of new technology that's, that's manifest and expressing itself. Did you have a favorite one? What, what were all those new things uh, that allowed, allows us to see things in a new way that's giving us new understanding? Um, I'm not sure what specifically you're talking about. I'm, I'm sort of thinking of things like uh, I was. I remember seeing early uh, seminars about MRI, for instance, which has now become this idea of functional MRI that allows a real-time look inside at brain activity, warmth or activation or energy. And that has started to give us new insight that may turn out to be correct, may turn out to be incorrect, but it's giving us new ways to look at something. And I'm thinking of all these, these, these new understandings that you talk about in your book. Many of them come about because we have brand new ways of looking at things. And so my question is about this connection between new ways of looking at things giving us new ways to understand things. And there was a lot of that. Yeah, I would have to say that you know the fMRI chapter was, you know, that entire chapter was basically about a null result. <laughs> Because, you know, science progresses at its own pace and doesn't care about my book deadline. The study that I participated in is not yet completed. Um, and I, and I, I, I love fMRI, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful tool. Um, a lot of that chapter ended up being about what fMRI can and cannot tell us about ourselves. I would actually say some of the most interesting, but I mean, obviously it's a useful tool. I would say some of the most interesting things that I discovered were the technologies and tools that were starting to develop for virtual worlds. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that was something that was not in the original book proposal, but you know, uh, Sean and I both uh, participate marginally in Second Life. 
and you build an avatar and we already know that we psychologically bond very strongly with those avatars. Uh, Jeffrey Balenson at Stanford has been doing a lot of interesting work in here. But with the emergence of haptic devices and interfaces and all these different kinds of things like brain implants and you know, it's going to get to the point where our online selves are going to be very, very uh, bonded with us both physically and as well as psychologically. We're not that far from that. We're maybe 20 years from that. That's, that's astounding. Do you think anyone ever expected uh, virtual reality and second life to become a scientific and philosophical tool for understanding <laughs> consciousness? Uh, it's yeah. given us a lot of insight, hasn't it? Yeah, I would say that there's kind of a that there was always that element in it. It was never just a game, right? We, uh, 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 Jared Lanier was playing around with virtual worlds and creating a virtual lobster and seeing how his brain could adapt to get him to like move extra limbs and things like that. You know, 20, 30 years ago. So it's always had that element of exploration, um, and I think that's going to continue. I love the fact that it's now being used in actual scientific research. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know. How do you bond with your avatar, and how do you figure out how to move, say, extra limbs? It turns out you can use micro movements, and uh, your brain will adapt. It's just astounding. Okay, I'm just I'm here doing some sharing on social media, so that's where I'm like, oh, I'm listening, I'm listening. So uh, actually, so Jeff did ask, and I and I'd love the answer. Which which was your favorite thing to pursue uh, in the book? Like like oh, you know, either you were looking forward to it and it meet, met all your expectations, or you were like, oh, I had no idea this was going to be so fascinating. Um, you know, th there's, there's, a, there's one infamous chapter in particular, which was, you know, we, we dropped acid. And, and, you know, that was something that I'm just, the irony of that is that I actually do not do drugs. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm a complete lightweight when it comes to alcohol. And um, so... Mm -hmm. But when a friend of ours told us about the effects on the sense of self, I thought, well, this clearly has to be covered in the book, and I can't really write the chapter if I haven't experienced it, because it's a very subjective experience. So um, that was probably the most surprising thing that we did, um, and we, you know, we, we quite liked it. We haven't done it since, um, but it ended up being a really positive experience. And, you know, Sean can weigh in here as well, but... Um, I mean, you, you end up getting this sense of being disembodied. Like, there's still an I. There's still this, like, conscious I identity there. But your your body is just sort of, just the molecules are just dispersed with everything else. And you're kind of floating, you know, and suspended, you know, along with the rest of nature and the universe. And, you know, I can see how some people would find that very upsetting. I actually thought it was really cool. But the uh, that chapter was also, I was very interested to read about uh, this process of reassessing the potential for LSD and psychedelics in treating alcoholism, some other addictive behaviors, and making that connection between uh, rediscovering the sense of self. And well, um, how I, does that reassessment come about? How do you get over, how did it get over those barriers? What's going on? That was a really rich chapter. <laughs> yeah, you know, it really was. It was very interesting. I mean, uh, there was a lot of psychedelics really have to have to shake off that '60s culture war stigma. Mm -hmm. Um, that it's sort of developed. And, and I think that that's already beginning to happen. There's been a couple of studies in England, one involving magic mushrooms, or at least psilocybin, which is the active ingredient, and the, they just finished one involving LSD. Um, and now that we have these, as you said, these brain imaging tools, we can watch what happens to the brain. And what's fascinating is how it expands your perception. It doesn't, it's not an increase in brain activity, it's a decrease. It mm -hmm. turns out that a lot of what the brain does is construct reality for you, and when you're on a psychedelic, it reduces that to a certain extent, that activity, so that it really does literally expand your perceptions. You know, you, you're getting a little bit more information that the brain would otherwise allow through. Um, I was surprised when you made that, uh, this is parenthetical, but when you made that observation that it's decreasing activity and then the connection you made to how uh, people in comas have been given what we would think of as tranquilizers and things, and that causes them to wake up. What a startling result! But yeah. it ties into the same understanding, right? Um, that's a different chapter. That's the consciousness chapter, but it is mm -hmm. very interesting um, because what it what it tells you is again you have this default network, and when that gets disrupted. Um, which anesthesia will do? Um, it, it's various anesthesias that they're that they're investigating in that in that case. 
And it turns out that if you give someone an insomnia drug or, or a sleep drug, it actually, when you take a drug to help you sleep, initially you're more awake, and then mm. the drug kicks in and you fall asleep. That mm. first stage, apparently, a couple, if they've, gi they've given it to um, people in comas, and some of them have kicked out of the coma, and they're not quite sure what that is. It does something with the brain's uh, default network. Um, it, it, it has this very wonderful small world network organization, which means you've got, it's the airline system, right? You've got a, couple, a few major nodes yeah. and a lot of smaller local connections, and the whole thing gets integrated. And um, when that's not, when that integration is disrupted in any way, you lose consciousness. Um, yeah. Coma under anesthesia or whatever. Um, that's, I think, what you're referring to. Yeah, and something while, while I'm there that's close to another, something I wanted to ask about. you. You wrote something that caused me to make write down a note that said this, and I don't know what it was right now, but this <laughs> seems to indicate that we'll need a new idea for how to understand the brain's operation or operating before we can make the next level of progress in understanding how we operate. And um, I'm wondering whether you think that's true. And then, you know, this question for Sean is like, well, I think in to ask about an interesting example that led to a similar level up movement in, in particle physics that said in, we had to have a breakthrough, a new, a new way, way to look at to things, look at things uh, in order in to order make to progress. progress. And there's, there's, so there's some stuff that I was reading about, I wish I could remember exactly what it was, that says there's something we're missing about how the brain works, but maybe we're starting to see some hints. Um, are, we, are we on the verge of a breakthrough in understanding, a new understanding? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I, I talked to Patricia Churchland, who's a neurophilosopher, because obviously, you know, I needed some guidance. Consciousness is a big, messy area. And, you know, she made the point that neuroscience is really just a baby compared to physics. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly found that while I was writing the book, my prior book was about calculus, and calculus really hasn't changed substantially in 300 years. <laughs> so, and a lot of this stuff is new and changing every day. She said, you know, we're pre-Newton and pre-Kepler. We're still discovering that there's moons around Jupiter uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to neuroscience. But there are some interesting ideas, and one of the most important things is um, we are no longer looking at it as there's a seat of consciousness somewhere in the brain. Mm -hmm. There's very much a network of networks, a complex networks analogy that's at work here. And when you have that, you get, to, you get what's known as an emergent phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, which is not the same as saying that consciousness isn't real. I, I, mm -hmm. I always push back a little against the use of the word illusion. But it's, it's an interesting question. You know, what do we mean by real? And to me, a construct, an emergent property is a real thing. It's measurable, even though it's not maybe physically made of atoms, but it's still a real thing. So I don't like the word illusion. I think that is the new paradigm that we're starting to talk about. Maybe Sean can uh, add a little bit on that. Yeah, actually, I think this is where investigations in consciousness and neuroscience intersect with fundamental physics, because at bottom, we are made of atoms bumping into each other. And at top, we have this very cartoonish point of view, implicit in many of the ways we think about consciousness or the brain or whatever, as if, you know, inside our heads, there was a little person, you know, pushing lev levers to make us do this and make us do that. And obviously, it makes no sense to think there's a little person inside our heads, which is our consciousness, moving us around, because what is inside their heads and how does that work? And many of these mysteries of consciousness become at least a little bit clearer when you realize that there's no one conscious center of consciousness, like Jennifer just said that the brain is full of many, many neurons, many, many different parts of the brain talking to each other, ultimately made of many, many different atoms, just obeying the laws of physics. And thinking of the brain, you should, it should be much more like a committee than a dictatorship, right? There's different parts <laughs> trying to suggest different things, and sometimes you get overruled, and sometimes you get sleepy to do the wrong thing, and there's this weaving together of all these different strands that makes you the person that you are. And thinking about you know, what happens when you dream, or what happens when you have a near-death experience, or what happens when you're on LSD. It, we don't know the final answers to all these questions, but it makes a lot more sense if you think of a physical system sort of under stress or referring to its old memories or things like that. And so I think that you know, even though we are pre-Galileo when it comes to neuroscience, it is very, very promising that with the new technologies we've talked about, with the new way of thinking about the brain, we're really going to have a startling amount of new knowledge coming in along the way. 
people and this, have. Uh, this actually makes me think of um, uh, Penrose and Hameroff, right? So Penrose is Roger Penrose, a physicist. Now, that model of quantum consciousness, you know, it, it, you know, I don't know where to put it. You know, is it does it fall into New Age? The New Age people are, you know, grabbing onto it. But you know, I know where does, to put it. <laughs> you do. Where do you put it then? <laughs> yeah, I, you put it in the new agey thing. I mean, I think okay. that these guys have given quantum mechanics and consciousness a slightly bad name because, of course, <laughs> quantum mechanics is the way the world works. Quantum mechanics does describe reality at the deepest level. So there's no question that there are things that happen in biological systems which classical mechanics is not up to describing. In, in mm -hmm. areas like photosynthesis and areas like smell, we've discovered that you know biological evolution has led organs in the human body to really take advantage of quantum mechanics or organs in a, in a leaf doing photosynthesis. And it's completely possible that the brain might take advantage of quantum mechanics in a very mechanistic way, that you know it might be that transmitting a certain signal from one part of the brain to another might be more efficient if you sort of use the fact that the world is quantum rather than classical. Mm -hmm. But it's nothing like, you know, there's an essence of consciousness that relies on the quantum mechanicalness mm -hmm. of it all. It's just that it's sort of a mechanism that happens to be a little bit more efficient. So, you know, the consciousness researchers have a tough time because we know so little about <laughs> it and everyone thinks they know so much about it that they need to fight back against a lot of uh, people who aren't really experts trying to come in and add their little insights in their own little ways. You, you might not risk it, but I, but I freely use the word mumbo-jumbo when it comes to quantum mechanics and, you know, woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Uh, and emergent properties of, of things doesn't need any of that. And uh, you sound like you're optimistic, and maybe I am too, that, that the uh, people, people accuse us of the reductionist paradigm and being too married to that. It seems to be working, and uh, this idea of emergent properties at all these different levels, uh, sort of optimistic that maybe uh, we'll start to hook up some of these levels from neurobiology back down to the physical world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think two things are true at the same time, which apparently some people have trouble accepting. But one thing is there is a way of talking about reality that is reductionistic and is accurate. That the world is made of quantum fields interacting <laughs> with the rules of quantum mechanics obeying Schrodinger's equation. And that is a perfectly legitimate way of talking about the world, and it doesn't leave anything out. You don't need anything outside of the laws of physics at the reductionistic level. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only way of talking about the world. And even if it captures what happens at that level, there's plenty of other ways that are perfectly legitimate, like Jennifer just said. If something is an emergent phenomenon, whether it's consciousness or color or temperature, that doesn't mean these things aren't real just mm -hmm. because they're nowhere there in the standard model of particle physics. And the levels exist by themselves and they have connections between them. And I am very optimistic that we're going to start filling in the whole map as time goes by. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if may... I could, uh, would it be okay, Jeff, if I switch gears because I'm really curious. Yeah, go you ahead. I, there are too many things appeared... I've got here. <laughs> you both appeared on um, TV and in various types of media and of course you communicate via writing and Jennifer you were the former director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange and I'd like to talk a little bit uh, or have you guys talk a little bit about the importance of communicating science with the general public and for instance movies getting it right. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that, that was that was something that I did for a couple of years. Now, obviously, um, this I, I wrote a book called The Physics of the Buffyverse, so I've always had kind of a pop culture element. <laughs> so I was kind of a natural choice when the National Academy of Science wanted to set up this outreach program, or, or rather, more appropriately, a cultural exchange program between science and the entertainment industry in Hollywood. Um, so for two years, from 2008 to 2010, um, I helped them set up this program. And essentially, we it started out as kind of science consulting. We would introduce, we would we would uh, get requests from writers, directors, producers in Hollywood. We're working on this movie, and uh, it has this scientific component. We need an expert in X. Can you find one who actually understands something about narrative? Because obviously, when you're dealing with Hollywood and movies, story is central. The science is in service to the story. Now, when it's done right, uh, when you actually have an, a conversation between the scientist and the writer, for example, 
and they're really in, in sync and on the same page, the, the science actually opens up more narrative possibilities. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have a good match. So a, lo a lot of what we were trying to do there was trying to build relationships uh, between these people. And I think that's actually happened. I mean, I haven't been with the program for several years now, and Sean has, is still doing science consulting on various um, films and TV shows and things. And I really feel like he's developed relationships uh, with, with some of these people, and that, that can only be a good thing. And I can let him tell you a couple of things that he's worked on recently um, to that end. Go for it. Jennifer's point is exactly right. It's not, it's not when you're making a major Hollywood blockbuster, you, it's not a science documentary. That's not why it's there. And many scientists uh, are not good at science consulting because they think that their job is to copy edit, to go in and say, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. And this is utterly unhelpful. And I think that you know this has gone on for decades. And I think that many people in Hollywood have this idea that scientists are not people you want to talk to. I mean, Jennifer and I have had experiences of being at a party and meeting someone who is a TV writer, and we say we're scientists, and they literally want to run away. Like, they're like, don't tell me what my show is all incorrect and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I think that we as scientists and science communicators need to develop a more helpful reputation because we cannot just say where people are going wrong. We can actually add new ideas. We can be mm -hmm. constructive. And by doing that, we, it, the end result is a more sympathetic, more realistic portrayal of science on the screen. And that is where a huge number of people experience science in one way or the other. You know, there's some statistic that most Americans have never met a scientist face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if they had, it would be a very casual, uh, brief conversation of some sort. But they see movies and TV shows all the time, right? They see the Big Bang Theory, they watch Iron Man, and so forth. And these are not science documentaries, but if we can make the idea of science more natural, less scary, more interesting, uh, then it, it helps over, not this year or next year necessarily, but over the next 100 and the next 500 years, it helps science fit into the larger, larger cultural context. And that might just be, you know, making Jane Foster, who is Thor's love interest in the Marvel series, make her be a <laughs> physicist rather than a nurse. And then some 12-year-old girl, you know, sees the movie and says, oh, wait, Natalie Portman is playing a physicist. What's that? And who knows what effect that can have. Okay. Do you have uh, any favorites you would care to mention of, of a movie or programs that you think do well for science? Well, I, I actually wanted to bring this up because this is something that Sean did fairly recently at an episode of Bones where he actually spent several days on set writing equations on a blackboard uh, Richard Schiff, the actor, was playing a physicist whose gymnast daughter had been killed. And it, it was really very touching because, uh, yeah, it, it, originally, of course, uh, Booth, the FBI agent, thinks that he must have killed his daughter because he doesn't feel he's showing the appropriate amount of grief. And Brennan explains that the man feels things very, very deeply. He just doesn't express them in the way that Booth thinks he should. And the final scene is the father who has erased all the original equations of his research on the blackboard, and he has essentially written a mathematical poem to his daughter. The first equation is her birth, you know, the girl at rest. Then she's learning to walk, and then she's riding a bike, and then she's on a trampoline, and she's, like, flipping through the air and being a gymnast. And the final equation is her at rest again because she's died. And it's just, it was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen on television. It happened because someone on Bones had gotten over their fear of talking to a scientist and had invited, you know, Sean on set to actually make the equations real. I mean, it, it, it really, I mean, I was, I was like crying at the end. It was beautiful. Wow. That's what I have happens. to see that episode. That's what happens when you get the really perfect mesh. And it doesn't happen all the time, and I think that there's more false starts than successes, but those successes, that, that's true of anything. It's true of science. So I love it when things come together that beautifully. And that shows me that Hollywood is thinking differently about how they portray science. Hmm. And but scientists I, also need to learn that they're not going to make any money by being movie consultants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's this opinion that a lot of people seem to have that there's this thing that they would love to do, namely like hang out with Brad Pitt and George Clooney, that someone will pay them to do it. And wouldn't that be awesome? But, you know, that's really not how it works. I, I've gotten almost no 
recompense. You know, I got a bottle of wine once for uh, my science consulting and a sweatshirt, which I really like, my sweatshirt. But uh, <laughs> it's no way to, to earn a living. It's a good deed that we're doing, and it's fun to be to, to boot. So uh, I enjoy doing it, but I'm not going to quit the day job. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good to know. My um, So one thing here at U of I we're always so excited about is, of course, Ang Lee, famous director, when he, uh, well, his wife uh, got her degree in microbiology here at the University of Illinois, and everybody was so excited that when you watch the Hulk and you see the lab scenes, they look like real lab scenes, and people are using pipetters properly because he had his wife help <laughs> set up the lab, mm -hmm. so that at least that was accurate and wouldn't, um, you know, um, get in at least uh, you know, molecular biologists craw that, you know, hey, that's all wrong. What's the matter there? But, uh, you know, at least I thought that, you know, that's sort of a fun tale to tell that, you know, um, people use what's around them. So if scientists make themselves available and are, are actually helpful to the, you know, the movie industry without pay, um, you know, <laughs> that, that could be very, very, very helpful. Um, do, do you guys want, I, mind if I ask, did you watch Cosmos? Have you seen it? And if you did, what did you think of it? The new one, the reincarnation. Dare I yeah. use the word? <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm actually doing recaps for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, That's right, you are. That's right. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, was, I never actually saw the original. I've seen a couple of clips. So I, don't not, I do not have this baggage. You know, I didn't grow up with Sagan. You know, I have an evangelical Christian background, and it just was not what we watched when I was growing up. Um, but um, although I loved Demon Haunted World, you know, when I went to college. So, you know, it was, I was able to kind of approach it without that. Um, and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was good. I, I thought that the opening segment and then the one with the calendar, I mean, we've seen those a million times before. Yeah. But I, I, I think I would argue that, you know, why deny an, an entirely new generation the joy of discovering these, these, these wonderful right. viewpoints. My favorite part was the little cartoon with Bruno. Um, now I want to see an entire series telling the life histories of science, you know, scientists throughout history acted out. And I think Seth MacFarlane, a family guy type of, type of vibe might be perfect. Um, so I, I'm optimistic. I thought Neil deGrasse Tyson did a fantastic job. I think he's a fitting heir uh, to the Sagan legacy. And I also loved that final moment where he told his own story of meeting Carl Sagan and how it wasn't so much he'd already, that he already knew he wanted to be a scientist. What he learned from Sagan that day was what kind of person that he wanted to be. And that's important. I love the fact that they ended on that human note because the science is wonderful, but it has to fit with our humanity. And people are never going to, people have to see scientists as human beings first. That's right. I, I'd say over over the years, I do a, a lot of outreach in person, and then I watch a lot of science communicators. How do we best? And I'm still convinced that the best there there are two best ways for people to become truly, you know, to truly change their path to science. And one is to meet a scientist, uh, you know, that this this is very influential. And the other is to have really fantastic teachers. Um, because so I'm a biologist and I, this is just anecdotal but this is um, and even though of course I'm crazy about science I just you know it's fascinating to me all fields but I am a biologist um, but that both of my my well, I have four kids but my two oldest chose physical hard physical sciences to pursue but I totally thank the physics teacher at their high school Who's, who has inspired more kids to go into physics and engineering? So I, you know, I it's it's really great to see that human element on TV. So rather than you know a disembodied uh, voice speaking over a documentary, which can be inspiring, I think that human element is super important. So. And, and not talking head. So I was just going to give a plug for Particle Fever, which is a new yes. documentary that is yes. coming out. Uh, that has come out. You'll be able to get it, but it was very interesting because it is a documentary. Uh, it was actually uh, it originated from the mind of David Kaplan, who is a working particle physicist at Johns Hopkins, a, a theoretical particle physicist who had a tiny bit of film school training when he was younger. So he took uh, some seed money he got from a grant proposal and he used it to start this movie. And but the interesting thing to me was it spent very little time trying to explain the physics. 
They spend a little, a little bit of time, not, not absolutely none, but they, the whole movie is about the Large Hadron Collider, the search for the Higgs boson and other new particles in particle physics, and the fact that this is a historically unique event, that the whole field could come crashing down if it doesn't work well and so forth. But, you know, and that was, that was explained, but almost all of the attention was given to the characters and to the drama, to the mm -hmm. story of the people doing the science. And I don't think I've ever seen anything on TV or film that captures as accurately the reason why scientists are excited about the science they're doing. Uh, you know, you can say that it's cool and you can, you can give the answers, you know, like we discovered new planets and stuff like that. But to watch the process, you know, to, to interview the scientists before they know whether it will work and then to see them be anxious about it and, and you know, the, um, uh, the one woman, Monica Dunford, is that, was that her name, Jennifer? Yes. Monica? Uh, she's a young postdoc on the experiment and you, know, you see her going in there to the, one of the little tiny cubby holes where they're working and she says, you know, everyone at the experiment is very, very nervous right now, but here in this room all the other people are Italian, so we're pretty <laughs> mellow actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you see all that real humanity come out. So I would definitely see if, if anyone is, uh, has the chance and is interested in the life of scientists as well as the substance of science, then part of Fever is a good choice. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of uh, references on social media from people I didn't even know had any interest in science who've managed to go see the movie and and have really really enjoyed it. And uh, so just so everybody in the audience knows, there's um, uh, it's in limited release right now. So you do have to go to the website and look and see where it's at. You're not just gonna open up your paper and the entertainment section, see it there necessarily, you might, um, but check check the larger cities uh, for that. I think that's really, uh, I think it's exciting. I'm looking forward to it. I might have to make a trip to Chicago for that, though. <laughs> It'll be on Netflix <laughs> before too long, don't worry. That, that's true. That's true. I look forward to that. So um, here's a simple one, Sean. Do you have any idea, while we're talking about celebrities and things, how in the world the Higgs boson became such a celebrity? Well, it's an interesting question because part of the reason I wrote my book was because to a working particle physicist it's perfectly clear why the Higgs boson is such a big deal. On the one hand it's the final particle of the standard model of particle physics. On the other hand it's completely different from all the other particles. So it was you know, in some sense an audacious gamble to say that there was such a thing as a Higgs boson. You know, it, it, before we discovered it directly, it certainly fit the data, explained everything, you know, we couldn't think of anything better, but it was still totally different than anything we had any rights to say we had discovered before. Having said all that, it's very difficult to explain why it is so different and why it is so special. And, you know, the, it comes down to the fact that the Higgs boson is not what's important. What's important is the Higgs field pervading mm -hmm. all of space that we all move mm -hmm. through that affects all the particles that we're made of. If it were not for the Higgs field, we would not be here. We would not be able to have atoms or chemistry or life or anything like that. So it was an audacious idea. It was crucially important to physics, and it plays a very, very important role in the structure of the universe we see. So despite the fact that it's hard to explain, somehow we got the message across and people knew it was a big deal, so I'm happy to, that that happened. I want to make this a, 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 question, a question about, about communication. communication, but you mentioned field. field. You and I both you know, work in areas where the idea of fields are pervasive and they seem perfectly normal and a rather obvious concept after so many years. What do you do, how do you go, do you about, go about with a big, with a big fundamental concept like field with people who've never encountered it before, what, what do you tell them about it? How do you get across the idea? Do you go with something simple, with something big? Do you take the time? You go through it slowly and Jennifer's going to have concepts like these too, but what do you do with, with long concepts that people can understand but it takes time? Yeah, My actually, so we should let Jennifer <laughs> chime in on this also because she knows better than any other human being in the world that I'm an evangelist for quantum field theory, that I think that we scientists and science communicators just need to stop pretending that we can ignore this. And it's very, very true. If you buy popular physics books, they'll explain relativity and black holes and quantum mechanics and string theory and the multiverse to death. And they will never mm -hmm. mention quantum field theory. 
if you go to a university with a good physics department and, and look at the physics books section, you'll find dozens of books on quantum field theory. It's like it's the most important thing that we never tell anybody. So my <laughs> attitude is just tell people. Just admit that the world is made of fields, and the reason why they look like particles to us is because of quantum mechanics. And explain that. You, know, you can do it in three or four minutes, and it won't be crystal clear to people, but it will give them that entree, and then they start hearing it more than once, and it will become a little bit clearer. And if I'm, if I'm only given 30 seconds, then I rely on the insane clown posse. Because those guys wrote this song saying, you know, frickin' magnets, how do they work? It became very famous, and the reason why magnets, we know why magnets work, right? But it is kind of amazing how they work, and the reason why they work the way they do is because there's a magnetic field. The magnet pulls on the refrigerator even before it touches it because there's an invisible magnetic field surrounding the magnet. And that's how everything in the world works at a very deep level, and everybody should know that. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, but then what do you do, Jennifer, when somebody says, well, what, what's consciousness? And you just, and you just took 300, 300 pages, pages to explain it, and do you try well, to... Well, I mean, I don't think I still? took 300 pages to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, I mean, I mean the, the challenge, of course, of, of something like the self is, you know, it, it gets back to what we were talking about at the beginning of these different ways of talking about the same thing. You know, how you talk about the self kind of depends on which kind of scientist you're talking to. You know, if you're talking to a physicist or a social psychologist or a neuroscientist or a philosopher, they're all go or they're all going to have a slightly, or a biologist, they're going to have a slightly different take, all of them, on how, on the, the vocabulary that they choose and on what level they choose to talk about the self. Um, so, you know, ideally you do want space, you know, and, and to do that. I mean, you're not going to ever capture everything. But I think Sean is correct. You can take a difficult subject and at least get some sort of gist of it. It is hard mm -hmm. to boil everything down to about three minutes, but if he can do it for quantum field theory, at some point we're going to be able to do it for consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and he really is an evangelist about this. When he was writing the Higgs book, you know, he would come down and say, people really, really want to know about quantum field theory. And I would go, Honey, no, they, they really don't. <laughs> they just no, don't know no, it yet. Yes, no, I was going to say, it's the same no, 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 mentality. You, they don't and, know they need this yet. <laughs> he said, yes, they do. They just don't know it yet. That's exactly but, you know, he wrote a wonderful chapter on it. And, you know, I read it and thought, you're right. I agree. People do want to know this. They just don't know they want to know They it. don't know they. So, and in fact, it, later today, if you read my blog, you will find a blog post will appear that explains the connection between Albert Einstein and Pi. You know, tomorrow <laughs> is Pi Day, March 14th. Right. It's also Einstein's birthday. And people throw them together because it's both sort of science-y somehow. Yeah. Yeah, in exactly. fact, there's a very direct connection between Einstein and Pi. The, the number Pi appears in Einstein's equation. Why is that true? Because it's a field theory, not a particle <laughs> theory. And I will explain why. <laughs> so so when you, you you just mentioned something where Jennifer you said Sean came downstairs and said you know this what about this so <laughs> why don't you both give us all a glimpse into what it must be like to have two science writers in the same house what does this look like <laughs> <laughs> what does your day look like you know does it end with pillow talk and you're sitting there talking about exciting scientific discoveries or you know, is it just as mundane sometimes, as everybody else's life? <laughs> sometimes it actually does end up with people talk on science stuff, and that bothers Sean because I always wait until he's tired and wants to go to sleep to ask him <laughs> a question about something. It's like, tell me more about this limit, you know, and you know, and an infinity in the multiverse, you know, before you go to sleep after a very, very long day. But I also think <laughs> we we benefit from each other because we come at the same thing from slightly different but complementary perspectives. Um, I've certainly, you know, deepened understanding of physics, and I've gotten over my fear of equations. Um, mm -hmm. I love calculus in part because Sean encouraged me and told me, by all means, you can do this. You know, stop telling yourself you're bad at math. You're fine. Um, and he, in turn, I think, has developed a, a more narrative voice and a little bit more of a story approach, which I think showed up in the Higgs boson book in particular. Um, so, you know, he can comment more on that. What we've talked about in the past, that, that we each bring something unique and we learn from each other. We haven't yet uh, collaborated on a book because we haven't found, you know, we actually do have kind of different 
arenas, but at mm -hmm. some point I think it would be interesting if we found the right topic. Uh, we would each bring our own unique uh, strengths to that, and uh, you know, a book by both of us might actually be the best of both worlds. So maybe one day that will happen. <laughs> so. Sean, anything to add? Yeah, I think it's very important to recognize that doing science and communicating science are two completely different skills. And both mm -hmm. of them, doing science and communicating science, can be done in many different ways. There's no one right way to do it. And so, you know, before I started writing popular books and before I met Jennifer, I was certainly, you know, uh, practiced and accomplished at giving physics lectures, teaching physics courses. And that is a skill. And, you know, you need to develop it over time. I didn't start out being good at it, but I, you know, I tried to get better. And then writing a textbook is a different skill than that. And writing a popular book is a different skill than that. And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to learn how to do better all the time. And certainly having a person in the house who came at it from an English major, professional journalist perspective, uh, is very, very helpful when it comes to you know, appreciating the difference between teaching a one semester course and writing a popular book. For one thing, you can't take for granted that the people who start are going to be there at the end. You don't, they don't need to read your book because mm -hmm. it's not a requirement. It's not a grade. Yeah. <laughs> so you really need to sort of give them something right away. Right? You really need to pay off much earlier and rather than saying, okay, chapter one, notation. Right? That would not work. <laughs> uh, and I was not tempted to do that. I figured that out by myself. But I think that, you know, there's a million different skills that are necessary in this game. And we're both, you know, learning all the time. So speaking of, uh, of the writing art and process, the qu a question that I wanted to be sure to get in was now that they've finished the books, they've been put aside, they've been published, do the ideas continue to percolate, and now do you have a better understanding of something, or do you have something that you regret not writing about? The of little... course. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Okay, that was a that was a good simple answer. Anything you would care to reveal? That's the life of a of a writer or teacher or scientist. Yes. No. I mean. Certainly, I, I have better explanations for things now than I did when I wrote my book about them. Um, you know, they, I think that the explanations in the books are still pretty good, so I'm, I'm happy with them. But yeah, I think you're definitely going to continue to get better at it. And maybe in the days when all books are primarily published online, maybe there'll be more of a chance to you know make them organic documents and keep updating them. And that will be a terrible, terrible situation for writers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm much happier now that I can move on without needing to buy things forever. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it is always the case that you finish a book, and you know it's not that you're not proud of it, but you also know that if you went back two years later and, and wrote, tried to write the same book, you would write it very differently. Because you know, I, I look at each of my books as a... As, as a as part of a learning process. You know, I want each one to be slightly better than the last one. I want to take what I learned from writing the last three and have it feed into the fourth. And now that I've written four, all of the, everything I learned over the course of those four books is going to feed into the fifth. I mean, that, that's, that's just how it works. Um, and it's never going to be perfect. It's always an evolving yeah. process. And at some point, you have to let go of the need mm -hmm. for perfection and let it go out in the world imperfect you know, and ugly, you know, in a couple places. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different uh, context, but can I quote I you, quote Jennifer, you saying, saying you wrote towards, towards the end that ultimately, ultimately, ultimately the, story the story is not about the destination, it's about, oh shoot, it's about everything you've learned along the way. Yeah. And, and I think, that, I think that's, that's, that's True, true, right? For this kind of project, it's, it's something you do. It's a story you tell, you do a good job, and by golly, you better leave it alone and tell another story. <laughs> well, I mean, you, do, you, you do try and draw conclusions, um, you know, and I certainly did, did, you know, I did form opinions, but those mm -hmm. opinions are flexible as the science continues to change, as more evidence comes in, I keep it open. You know, I may change my mind about consciousness in 10 years if, if something really fast, if, if a major breakthrough happens that changes what we, how we think it works now. You know, I think it's important to recognize that science itself is an evolving progress process. Yeah. Um, and I also, I really in this book did not want to speculate too far beyond the evidence that we had. I really wanted it to be about the science. What does science tell us about the self? I have philosophical opinions about the self. Everybody does because we all have a self and we think about it. But, you know, this one I really very much wanted to focus on, you know, what can we tell from the science and where does the science have nothing to say? When there are places like that, I think consciousness is one of those areas where science is still figuring things out. And I think this is a broader truth 
about a philosophy of life, right? You know, you shouldn't approach science as, all right, all right today I will learn science, and at the end of the day I will understand science. That's <laughs> how it actually happens. And I think that when I do, you know, outreach and popularization, a lot of people think it's about inspiring young people to become scientists. But, it, mm. but it's not. I mean, I hope that happens. That would be great. But it's not about making you little scientists. It's about making every person appreciate science and do it on a day-to-day -day basis. And by doing it, I just mean understanding a little bit more about the universe. You know, it really is the process. It is not the final destination. There's no reason why once you leave college or once you take that intro astronomy course, that has to be your last engagement with science, no matter what it is you do professionally for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, I'm looking. We have talked. We never have problems talking. We've talked for nearly an hour, and and I'd really uh, love to let you both have the last word. Um, if there is something you would like to share about your latest book with the audience, uh, captive audience right now, um, I'd like you each to take a turn and do that. So Jennifer, you want to go first? Are you making me go first? <laughs> oh, well, if you want to yeah. pass it off to Sean, you know, you guys can. No, I, I, uh, I think I kind of, I, I kind of liked where I, where I ended, uh, you know, on the last, you know, that this was really a process uh, for me. Because I, I, it's never, you know, this notion that it's never perfect, you know, that, that, that we're all a work in progress, that science is a work in progress, you know, and, you know, it, what Sean also said that it's not about making everybody a working scientist. It's about making sure that science is something that everybody engages with every day, the same way they engage mm -hmm. with a book or with a movie or with art or music. You know, these are all part of the human endeavor, and we tend to think that science is something else over here, and it's not. It's something that should be incorporated into the culture as a whole. Um, everybody should be experiencing a little bit of science every day. It should not be something weird and only for geeks. And that's our goal as science communicators. That's great. Sean? I think that in, uh, in my book there is one little hidden message that is, is it seems surprisingly subtle for people to catch on to. So I spend time emphasizing it, which is there are things that we know and there are things we don't know. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, believing both of those two things at the same time, it seems to be very, very difficult for some people, even, you know, science communicators sometimes. You, you hear it, it, sometimes people outside science have the false idea that it's all about absolutely settled, rigorous truths, right? Things have been proven beyond any doubt, and science is a collection of facts. And as soon as you get into it, you know that's, that's not true. It's evolving. You're always trying to do better and to throw things uh, overboard, old, bad ideas. But then sometimes people overcorrect, and they say, you know, science is all about admitting you know nothing. And that's just as wrong. You know, there are things we know. There are things we understand. And the fact that there are other things we don't understand does not invalidate the fact that there are things we do understand. And the, the connection to the Higgs book is that, you know, we understand how atoms work. We understand the stuff of which you and I are made of. We don't understand how they all fit together. We don't understand, you know, even a single complicated atom or nucleus for that matter. But we do understand the basic underlying rules. There's no room in there for a dramatic shift in our in our change of mm -hmm. understanding. Even though we know that mm -hmm. we're not done with particle physics or fundamental physics by any stretch, we do think that you and I are made of atoms, and a million years from now we will still think that you and I are made of atoms, and those atoms will still be made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And that is an accomplishment that the human race has every right to be proud of. Great. Uh, I guess thank you both, uh, first of all, for what you do, because I enjoy reading your works. Like I said, I've been following Jennifer since I sort of found you can read science on uh, the internet, and then you know I discovered Sean's along the way, because I think Sean, I'm sorry, I think I accidentally found you because I was looking for Sean B. Carroll. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> I, so I am a biologist, what could I say? But he then... has the beard, so he's the evil twin. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for those who don't know, Sean B. Carroll's an Evo Devo uh, biologist who, who writes very well as well, but on a completely different topic. So, um, And Jennifer has an evil twin who is a fashion designer, so... 
what you know what can we do here <laughs> but uh, I, I visit your works as often as I can thank you both for joining us it's been a pleasure to speak to both of you at the same time and uh, I'm sure I speak for Jeff when I say we look forward to your next work you do it's been most enjoyable conversation thank you so much thanks it's been great to be here yep thanks a lot great thank you so much